live. Um, I'm here at Ferrari Carano Vineyards and Winery in Dry Creek Valley in Sonoma County, California in the lovely library room uh, which is set inside the Villa Fiore tasting room and I'm here with associate winemaker Rebecca Dyke who um, is going to be sharing with us three really delicious Ferrari Carano wines from some very familiar, beloved, great varieties um, within Sonoma County, and these are some of Ferrari Carano's best-selling, top, most beloved wines. Um, so before we get into that, I wanted to start by asking you, Rebecca, um, how long have you worked at Ferrari Carano? I've been here since 2004. It's my first vintage. I started working with the white wine, so it's nice we're starting with the white wine today um, at our state winery back in 2004. So it's been 12 years. I worked. 10 years at the White Wine Facility, and, and then a couple years ago, I started working as a, an associate wine manager at our, our Red Wine Facility. Um, so that is a, that's a really, 12 years. Yeah, it's an awesome tenure to have in one place. Um, and it's pretty common, I think we talked about this last time we had you on, um, a lot of the people who work at Ferrari Carano have been here similarly long or yeah. longer. Yeah, I was just looking at that um, today, looking through some of our employees' histories, and you know, I see people here for 17 years, 19 years. It's, it's, yeah, we work all work together for quite a long time. It makes it pretty special. Um, are you guys able to hear us? How's our sound right now? I'm hearing that the volume is a little bit low. Um, I'm going to turn us up. How about now? Can you guys hear us now? We're going to sit tight a second. We're just kind of working out some kinks. So, um, Rebecca, do you want to talk so we can see how you sound? Sure. I, one of the things that's kind of neat about working so long for Ferrari Carano is all of our, we have a lot of vineyards, and I have the opportunity to learn and I know where all the vineyards are, all the white vineyards, all the red vineyards, and we have some amazing properties that we have, where we have grapes planted, and so I feel like proud about that, I guess. You know, not only is I get all to work with the people I've worked with for so many years, and and know, knowing how, how we all work together, but knowing, knowing the land, knowing the grapes, and what kind of wine that we're making from those vineyards. And Ferrari Carano, um, we're focusing on Sonoma County wines right now, but Ferrari Carano is in, um, has vineyards in five or six different AVAs, right? It's, well, for Sonoma County, we have, um, there's Dry Creek, Russian River, Alexander Valley, and um, I'm forgetting already. <laughs> but we also have a vineyard, one of our oldest Chardonnay vineyards is in Napa Carnera. And then Mendocino now as well. Um, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think it works out so far. Yeah, um, Mendocino. Okay. So um, today I wanted to talk a little bit about our theme and our hashtag for the tasting. Um, we are calling it FC X Bordeaux, like FC uh, Ferrari Carano meets Bordeaux, and that's because the grapes. Um, these are varietal wines, um, one variety grape um, named on the label for each of these that we'll be tasting today. Um, and all of these grapes are some of the best known grapes in California, um, grow really beautifully in Sonoma County, and we will talk about how um, Ferrari Carano's vineyards are distinct. Um, but these are also uh, classic grapes that are classically grown in Bordeaux in France, of course, one of the most prestigious, famous wine growing regions of the world. Um, and Ferrari Carano has um, built itself um, quite a bit from its um, sort of small origin, but it's remained a family brand um, owned by Don and Rana Carano since its inception in the very early 1980s. Um, and it started in Sonoma County. So not all of the grapes in these wines come from this estate vineyard right here, um, but Sonoma is kind of the heart or the origin of the Ferrari Corona brand, and these are some of the most popular wines. And since we kept you guys waiting, um, 
since we started a little bit late here, I want to get right into the Fumé Blanc. So if you haven't already opened it, please join us in opening the 2014 Fumé Blanc, um, which is under screw cap. How long has it been under screw cap now? Oh, wow. Back, I think it was 2006, if I can remember right. It's been, been quite a few years. So it was really neat switching to the screw cap. It's just, it's just perfect for this wine. It's an early release wine, so you know we don't you don't need to age it. You basically once it's released, you can just start start drinking it. So the screw cap is really nice. Like you know, say you just want to have one glass of the wine, you can take it out of your fridge, pour yourself a glass, put that screw cap back on, and you know save it for the next night if you can. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it probably opens up quite nicely when there's just a little bit of oxidation so that the next day wine is at least as good, maybe showing some different yeah. things. Yeah, it keeps it pretty nice, actually, the screw cap. Yeah. Um, so I want to give a shout out to everyone we have with us tuning in on the broadcast. Um, you guys are welcome to start uh, digging into the aromas and flavors in this wine, which we will talk about. We'd love to hear um, questions about this wine and comments about what you're getting um, as you smell and taste the 2014 Fumé Blanc. Um, but I just want to say hello to everyone who is tuned in at home. Um, by everyone, I mean the bloggers whom we sent wine to who are tasting along with us. There are probably others who uh, maybe went out and bought the wines. And please, if you did um, and are tasting along as well, if we don't know you, give us a shout out. Use our hashtag and um, feel free to ask your questions as well. Um, our special bloggers who are joining us are Bill Iyer, who is at Cuvée Corner. We have Mark Fusco at 1337 Wine, uh, Alana Thompson at Palette Exposure. We have Megan Kenny, Sonadora, um, the wine stopper, Joey Casco, who is in Massachusetts. And I was saying there was a time where you weren't able to ship to Massachusetts. So it's really great to be able to bring some really awesome bloggers who have been around a long time um, into the fold now that it's legal to ship there. Um, Margot Savelle, hello. She's at Right for Wine. We have Kathy Sullivan at Wine About and her husband, Eric. Um, we have I Like This Grape. We have a few people from I Like This Grape um, tasting as a team. Jolene Patterson, who is one of our local um, Sonoma County educators and blogger, Instagrammer, advocate for everything Sonoma. Um, we have Lacey Fay at Lace Perspective. And then our Sonoma chat friends, Amy Lieberfarb and Sherry Hausman. And finally, we have Akasha Garnier, um, who is tweeting both, I think, as Akasha and as um, Gourmet Soiree. So we are so happy to have everyone with us today. Um, and please tell us about uh, the Fumé Blanc. I'll let Rebecca start telling us, and then you guys can chime in with your questions. Well, this is probably one of our most popular wines, I think, that we have here at Paris Wine Out. It's really, it's Sauvignon Blanc is what it is. We call it Fumé Blanc, but it is, the variety is Sauvignon Blanc. And we, I think our style is a little bit more unique compared to other styles. Um, we aim for really tropical flavors. It's fermented basically in 60% stainless steel tank and 40% neutral oak barrel. So it's not, we don't put oak on the wine, but we do add some creaminess from the barrel fermentation. You get two distinctively different wines when you ferment in tank versus in oak. So the stainless steel tank fermentation really retains the acidity in the Sauvignon Blanc and the barrel fermentation, which we do do a little bit of lead stirring too, which adds some creamy roundness to the to the mouthfeel of the wine. And so an another way that we achieve this more tropical style that you're smelling, I mean, it's still Sauvignon Blanc. You still get the grapefruit and the kiwi, but you also get more some pineapple and um, peach flavors from it. And out in the vineyard, how this can be achieved is by making sure we get plenty of sunlight to the grapes. So if you want to make a Sauvignon Blanc that's less you know, vegetal, less herbaceous, and, and more tropical fruity, then you allow a lot of more, more sun to penetrate through the canopy into the, the grapes. And so it's reducing the methoxy pyrazines that form the grapes, and it reduces any kind of bell pepper type of flavor that would have. So. Can I just um, pause you for two questions that came up in my mind? Um, 
I know what leaves stirring is, but I just want to take a little vocab moment and have you explain what stirring the leaves the leaves means. Um, and then I'd also, you just said a word, something pyrazine, methacin? Methoxypyrazine. It's, and it's this big like, chemical that, you know, that's bell pepper. That's the bell pepper flavor that you get in and great. And some, you know, Sauvignon Blancs have that and people love it. And so it's not like, it's not a bad thing. It's just like a stylistic choice if you want to allow that um, chemical basically to um, accumulate in your grapes, which, you know, comes out in the wine. Whatever your grapes taste like, that's what comes out in the wine. Or if you want to maybe not accumulate as much and, you know, in the sunlight, it helps to reduce that amount, reduce that level. Lee stirring is. What we do, you know, you do that very traditionally with the Chardonnay. So we do leaf stirring, and that's helping breaking down the leaves. Is you know solids that are in the wine, and also um, you know, all the yeast cells that are left over from fermentation. So, that dies, right? It's yeah, the yeah. They they die after fermentation is over, and basically the alcohol gets up high enough, and they have no more sugar to consume, so they. They die, they perish. <laughs> and then they, we, I mean, I mean that sounds darker than it is. I think. Yeah, but it's a good thing. Um, yeah. So they, you know, you do the leaf stirring helps get that yeast, the yeast cell, the leaves up into the wine, and over time they, it breaks, breaks down, and fatty acids are released into the wine and you know, gives a nice creamy mouthfeel. I mean, stirring the, the right after fermentation also helps liberate some of the um, carbon dioxide that's created during fermentation, you know, which would make it kind of spritzy if it was still there, but right. so that also is uh, released from the wine. Um, we have some really nice comments from uh, those who are tasting along with us at home, so I wanted to read you some of those. Um, Bill Iyer, Cuvée Corner, had a really nice comment. Um, he said that Ferrer Carano takes great inspiration from Bordeaux in their wines, that it shows um, that there is this classic sensibility um, to them, and uh, that it's not imitation. Um, and then Senadora said that she's getting lovely tropical notes, almost a pineapple aroma on the Fumé Blanc, which um, I think That's is what I would expect to, yeah. Yeah, I, I exactly. Think thing. <laughs> exactly what we, what you aim for, yes. Um, and to that point, uh, the wine stalker also said that there's more lychee than he remembers in the past on this vintage, and that he's liking it. Um, and he feels like the Fumé is one of the best um, Sauvignon Blanc deals on oh, the market. thank you. Oh, nice to hear. Yeah, I, what I like also about this particular tasting is that since we were focusing on these classic grape varieties grown in Sonoma County, you're also able to see a really kind of broad range of what Ferrari Corona produces. The Fumé Blanc is one of the flagship wines from Ferrari Carano and is something that you can find in the grocery store, in grocery stores across the nation, and is this great value wine. Um, the it's like yeah. fourteen dollars. Sometimes you can find it for even less than that. It's true. It's um, consistent. You know what to expect. So, and when you do find it, in, in you know in your local market, it's, it feels good buying it because you know what you're going to get. Yes, it's wine. got that reach, and you you see it and you know it and you get excited. Um, and then we've got, um, on the other end of the spectrum somewhat, um, we have the Reserve Cabernet Sauvignon. We have the Merlot in the middle, which we will be talking about. Um, but the range in, in price in these wines is from the $14 uh, suggested retail price up to $65 with the Reserve Cabernet, um, which is from Alexander, not sorry, Alexander. Alexander. Yes, yeah. yes, sorry. I always want to say Anderson, and that's not the same. Yes. Um, Alexander Valley. And uh, that wine gives you um, something that you don't typically find in the grocery store yeah. that you need to come to the winery or order from the website to get um, and is more of something that you do. Um, you can drink it upon release, but it rewards being laid down and um, tasted for years to come. And uh, I think that's kind of a, a neat showcase yeah. of the wines today. Yeah, it's got a nice spread of drink right now or drink later. Um, so Sonadora wants to know, um, why did you decide to use Fumé Blanc as the name for the Sauvignon Blanc? And we were just talking yeah, about we kind of the origin of the name. It was, well, it was what um, Robert Mondavi, I guess, coined the term or, and I guess it was, I think the reason why is because it was recognizable. 
to um, consumers, and so they bought it, and that's what Sauvignon Blanc became known as Fumé Blanc, and it was popular, and so that's why we use the name. It also has Sauvignon Blanc on the label, but yeah. we, I mean, we affectionately just call it Fumé. Yeah, my understanding um, to what you're saying is that um, there was a time when Sauvignon Blanc was blended into California's kind of bulk wines and didn't, people didn't know that it could be this serious grape, so he kind of wanted to do like a little bit of a rebrand with it and coin this name that was recognizable, hearkening back to where it's grown in the Loire, because it's not just grown in Bordeaux, in Bordeaux it is grown and blended with, um, sometimes it's 100% Sauvignon Blanc and sometimes it's blended with um, Sauvignon, Sauvignon and Muscadel. Um, but when you find it in the Loire, one of the most famous places there is Puy Fumé, and then he um, thought that kind of giving it this new face that didn't say Sauvignon Blanc might appeal to people at the time. And this wine with Ferrari Crano, um, I feel like celebrates it as a as a California Sauvignon Blanc mm -hmm. in calling it Fumé, and um, also uh, like um, harkens back to when it was first made at Ferrari Crano, which was how many years ago? I mean, this has been. And that over 20 years ago. I think it's, yeah, I think it's probably closer to 30, right? I don't know, right? Yeah. I don't wonder if I can't. I'm losing track. <laughs> Way longer <laughs> than even you or I have. Uh, yes, well, been a before part of I life. started working here, we were making this wine. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would love to hear. Um, let's talk about what you like to eat with this wine. I like, it has such. A nice opulence, but it is so food friendly. It is. Um, it was interesting. My husband was planning on going abalone diving off the Mendocino coast tomorrow, so I was thinking this would be the perfect wine to have with that um, fresh catch. Um, but we're thinking about kind of French type of foods. I was kind of thinking about this since we were kind of going the Bordeaux route of what would be nice with it. And I was thinking, you know, fish like a sole meunier would be really nice and have a like mushroom crepe would be tasty. Um, any you know any kind of seafood that you have, um, like mussels, some like chilled prawns would be really tasty too. I mean it really goes with a lot of different foods. It would be like a nishwa salad. Would that be nice too? It would. I like that when you have a wine that has um, this, I would say the acidity is, is strong on this wine, but not bracing. Like it's it's that elegant mouth watering mm -hmm. feel. When you have a wine that has that, um, especially white wines, I feel like you can do um, something really lean, but also has a lot of acidity, like a salad, or you can do something like you described. Um, something rich, like, like a, the mushroom. Mushroom cream. cream. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I love those kind of pairings that are kind of the opposite, where you want to cut the richness of the dish with the acidity and keep going back and forth. Mm -hmm. Like, wines with great acid like this are so perfect for that versatility. Um, let's talk about what you guys at home are tasting with this as well. I wanted to say that I was told by one of our bloggers, um, I was told by Kathy Sullivan that she was going to be making one of Rhonda Carano's um, mm -hmm. recipes from the website, which you can find on the Ferrari Carano site. So I am dying to hear um, how that came out. It was the capellini with arugula, um, prawns, and tomatoes. Yeah, that sounds delicious. Um, and that sounds to me a lot like a very fresh kind of Italian family pasta that you might make any night of the week, um, something that you can throw together quickly in spring or summer. Um, and that goes back also to Ferrari Carano. Mm -hmm. um, they are Italian American. Yes, they are um, Italian heritage. And that can come into play too. Um, so I've got a couple more comments here. Um, Jolene Patterson said that she thought Fumé Blanc also indicated the use of oak on the wine, um, which I think at the beginning it sometimes did. Possibly. I'm not, I'm not sure if everyone uses that term, always uses oak. Um, At this point, I know some don't, yeah. but there is oak on this one. Yeah, um, it is oak, but like I said, it's not, and there isn't any new oak, it's all neutral oak. So, I mean, when you taste the wine, it's just like kind of a subtle, toasty vanilla. 
flavor that's there and that is from the oak. But it's more, it's a lot of it is like the ferment, the whole um, dynamics of the fermentation in a barrel versus a tank is it's different. Right. Um, I also want to give a shout out to um, Mark Fusco, 1337 wine, uh, who is broadcasting to some followers of his on YouTube. So hello to anyone tuning in to his broadcast. Um, and thanks everyone for being here and watching. Um, we hope that you are tasting at home, but I've always been really um, amazed that when we do these tastings, a lot of people are um, eager to ask questions of you and tune in even when they don't have the wine in front of them so yeah. that they can think about it later. Yeah, well hopefully we can describe it in a way that you can almost taste it. <laughs> yes. Um, Amy Lieberfarb, one of our Sonoma chat friends, Sip on This Juice, commented that it, it's also friendly for spicy food. Oh yeah. And I think that the tropical flavors really mm -hmm. um, play that up. Even though there's no like perceived sugar on it, it does have... That fruit makes it, yeah, gives like an almost a sweetness, but it's the fruitiness. Yeah, and that really is so nice when you have something that's spicy, and also a lot of spicy dishes are kind of spicy sweet. Yeah, I and mean, well, the alcohol's not that high, too, either, so, you know, you wouldn't want to pair a high alcohol wine with a spicy food, because this one's, you know, under 14%. Yeah, and I think that goes to the idea that um, old world wines also tend to emphasize that balance. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that Ferrari Crano executes well. Are we... Are we ready to move on to Merlot, do you feel like? I, I'm ready. Um, all right, I think we should go for it. So, our second line in our lineup, I'm going to set this one aside, is the 2013 Ferrari Crono Merlot. Uh, both of these first two wines come from the Classic series. Ferrari Crono has a few different families of wines, and these are both from the Classics. Um, and then our third wine is from the Reserve series. So, um, so this would be another wine that we've been probably making as long as the Fumé Blanc. Um, vineyard, you know, we have vineyards all over Sonoma County that have Merlot, and, and which is kind of neat because it, with all the different appellations, you have um, dry creek, which is warm, a warmer climate. And so we get a riper Merlot, almost like a blueberry pie kind of flavors from our dry creek vineyard, and then we head over to the Russian River, where we also have more Merlot planted, and I kind of get more of like cherry flavor, brighter, you know, gives a little bit more acidity to the, I wanted to call it a blend, but it's like the blend of the Appalachians, all in Sonoma County, and, and then you head up to our mountain ranches in Alexander Valley, so now we're looking at some Merlot that's coming from elevation, so that's going to give you some more structure in darker flavors, darker plum um, flavors from the, the mountain fruit. Did you say so, this is 100% Merlot? It's um, practically, it's almost, it's mostly all Merlot. And so, anyway, when we Put it in, it's only 25% new oak, so the fruit really comes through. And you know, we already have plenty of structure from the grapes from the hillside ranches, so we don't need a lot of oak to add to it too much. Um, it also like retains a really, in the mouth, you'll have the structure, but it's also really a smooth Merlot, like nice and flush, and has a really silky finish. This Merlot um, retails at, I believe, $25, um, which is, again, really... It's really affordable. Pretty, yeah, and it's been consistently so. Um, as long as Ferrari Corona has been making it, it's always been, um, you know, a nice wine, but one that you can um, not feel guilty opening. For an, an everyday meal, yeah. Exactly. Yep. Um, but again, I also feel like um, it... it holds up over time if you did want to let this age a little bit. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it does have, I mean, it has some weight there. And like I said, blending in some of the higher elevation Merlot does, you know, give it some structure, some weight. There's a lot of fruit there. So it's not going to die in the bottle next year. It'll be good for, you know, several more years. Right. But personally, I think it is tasting good right now. And I, 
I had bottles, I would just be drinking it because it's delicious. <laughs> But that would be, you know, your preference if you prefer more of aged character in wine or if you want it more fresh and fruity. The cherry that you described in this wine comes through really powerfully it's from It's now. almost like a cherry pie, like cherry pie feeling. And it integrates really well with the oak that's on the wine. The oak is not overbearing to me at all. It's just kind of seamlessly adding this um, yummy baking spice characteristic yeah. that again goes perfectly with cherry flavors, as you would have on a pie. Yes. Um, so tell us at home what you guys are getting out of your 2013 Merlot. Um, and while you start to tell us that, maybe Rebecca can tell us a little bit um, about the process in the winery. Um, well, we have, so like I said earlier, we have a separate facility that we make our red wines. Um, well, there's the Pinot Noir is made at our, um, Pinot Noir facility, the Lazy Creek out in Anderson Valley. So just to kind of separate that. We don't make the Pinot at a red wine facility. So all the other red wines are made um, at our red wine facility. It's not open to the public, unfortunately, but I can tell you that it is gorgeous. It's up on top of our Rock Rice Ranch at a thousand feet elevation. We have um, a vast um, series of caves where we store all of the wine while it's aging and the whole whole winery is designed it's 10 10 years old built in 2003 so it's uh, over 10 years old <laughs> i keep saying it's 10 years old but it's um it's 13 years old now <laughs> um but it's still very very modern it's to describe it all the tanks are organized in a semicircle, which is not, you know, normal for most wineries. They're just kind of in rows. So our tanks are all in a semicircle, and we have a great delivery system, like this arm, this conveyor that's on this railroad track that kind of swings around the semicircle of tanks. I don't know if I'm even describing this in a way that you can visualize in your head, but so this great just is your, um, delivery system is a series of conveyors. And so when the grapes come to the winery, we just dump them and then they go up the berries, whole berries go up the conveyors and get dropped into the tank. So it's designed as a, a gravity feed winery. And so that's kind of special and then the whole design of the winery is designed for making red wine. That's fantastic. Um, does it does it just feel like your own sort of, um, do you just feel like you get to come in and like, it's all perfectly designed for your needs? It is, it's, it's wonderful. It, and it, it definitely, we have our own little bottling line up there and um, it, it is, it's, re it's a really lovely, lovely winery and, and very functional. So we might have talked about this last time, but you get to interact and you've known Sarah Clider, the, um, Executive winemaker for a chrono for a long time. 15 years. Um, yes. Even longer than you've been here. Yes. Um, and she makes, in addition to being the My boss. broadly yeah. executive <laughs> winemaker, she also makes the white wines at Ferrari Chrono. Mm -hmm. How much do you interact face to face and are you at this facility very often at all? Or I interact with her practically every day. Back on the weekend too, but like every work day, um, we organize tastings because we taste through every lot of wine we have in that cave um, every month. So we check in with the wines every month, and in the meantime, we're also like making decisions for the upcoming blends. And and yes, we come down here, we taste wine with um, Don and Rhonda, um, we show them the blends that we've come up with, and. So yeah, I come down to the estate winery, I'm like down here, I don't know if anyone knows where we are exactly, but we're at the estate winery and I do come down off the mountain and to visit, you know, the, the estate winery and um, do some tasting with Sarah. I still get to taste the white wines from time to time once we're working on the final blend and then with Bob Mata. Um, That's awesome. And, uh, Probably a lot of you guys do know where our facility that we're at right now is. Um, I mentioned that it's in Dry Creek Valley. Um, it's in the north part of the valley as you're driving up um, on the main road. Yeah. And, uh, it's a beautiful um, 
villa structure um, with a large sign outside and an ornate gate. And when you come inside, um, not only do you find the upstairs and downstairs really lovely tasting rooms um, for a range of different tastings that you can do, there's also an outdoor terrace that overlooks the valley floor. It's beautiful. Um, and uh, Rhonda has quite the green thumb and uh, has worked for, I think, 16 years or more in uh, overseeing the landscaping of the property and um, helped to design the gardens here, um, which are seasonal. There's tulips, um, when tulips are in bloom, which is brief and happened, I think, in March this year. Yeah, so it's always early. <laughs> um, but there's, I think, peonies right now and um, just really beautiful, colorful manicured gardens. And then there's also the Japanese style garden um, sculpture fountains. It's really um, kind of a rose uh, garden. We have a cork, couple of cork oak trees. Yeah, so it's kind of a jaw dropping cork bark on it. And you said trees, which reminded me, I wanted to um, just talk a little bit about um, how, uh, not cork trees, but you went to um, the oak forest where they make oak barrels um, in France uh, on a trip hosted by one of the coopers that Ferrari Chronosource is from. So can you talk a little bit about that trip um, and what you got to do? Yeah, that was pretty, pretty exciting to go see a cork, or, um, cork tree. When was cork? That? I'm saying corks. I got to say sorry, corks. Sorry. <laughs> cork trees. Sorry. Cork trees. Oak, yeah. Cork trees. A forest. A forest that, you know, like the forests in France are all um, controlled by the government and really maintained, you know, to make sure that they're, you know, sustainable, basically. So that there's, because the trees are like 200 years old before they cut them down to make oak barrels out of them. So it was really neat to go see to an or the oak forest and you know, see where all our barrels are grown. And then I got to see a sawmill where they take the, the logs and cut those into the staves and then to the cooperage where they're actually constructing the barrels. So that was a really, really neat experience, especially since I've been, this only happened just this last year and I've been working, you know, in the wine industry since 2000. So. It was a pretty special thing to do. They also took us around to um, different wineries, like in Bordeaux and in Burgundy, to taste wine like directly out of their murals in France. So it was it was definitely a neat experience. I took lots of pictures. So I'm planning to give a presentation about the about oaks. You know how the barrels are made and on our Wine Club Cruise that's coming up in next year. Wow, where yeah. where is that going? Um, it's going from all all over Spain. It's just going around from Spain all the way around and even in London. So well, that's exciting. Uh, yeah, is that sold out already? No, I don't think so. You can still, pretty, yeah. I mean, we still have a year to go, but yeah, I already kind of started working on the presentations since they have these great photos from the from the trip. And do you and Sarah both get to go? Yes, yeah. She'll be giving a presentation on white wines, and I'll do one on red. So I'm going to do a, where we're tasting um, different barrels, different types of barrels. That is so See if our wine club members can taste the difference. That's like if you wanted to take this experience of tasting with us here and just immerse yourself in it for weeks <laughs> with the backdrop of France and... Being on a cruise, that yeah. sounds heavenly. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit more. You have one question about the Fumé Blanc, um, and then we'll go back to talking about the Merlot. Um, we were asked uh, just the logic behind using the cell enclosure, the screw cap, um, what made Ferrari Crown decide to make that decision? It's, we like the closure. I mean, you're not gonna get GCA for one. I mean, the corks are really good these days. I mean, all the testing we do to, um, you know, not buy corks that have DCA. So, I mean, that's gotten better, but still, you're not going to get TCA from um, screw cap closure. Also, another kind of driving factor behind it, you know, why haven't we made all of our wines um, screw cap? Um, it's most of the wines that we've switched to screw cap or screw cap, cap <laughs> are, are early 
really early release pressure for deer type of wine. So it's a really appropriate closure for the Fumé block. And I mean, it's so convenient. If you want to take the Fumé down to the beach or out to the lake and you just want to have a glass, put that cap back on, stick it back in your ice chest or bag and then pull it out for your next glass, you know? It's right. a really convenient closure and it also treats your wine really well. It's an awesome picnic wine for exactly the reason that you just yeah. described. I um, My wine's on the go. It's so nice to be able to um, know that you have this closure that you can screw on and it can go like back into a tote bag and it's not going to risk any spillage whatsoever. You don't have to keep track of the cork. Um, yeah. And it just makes it so easy. One less thing to carry because you don't need the yeah. corkscrew. Yeah. Um, do you get to travel for winemaker dinners? I know there's one coming up uh, next month at I have, No, I haven't done a lot yet, but I've done some. Yes, and they're fun, very fun to do. Um, yeah, getting to see your wines from grape uh, through the entire production and into the glass in front of an audience. Um, yeah, enjoying it. Yeah, I'm just like, it's always fun to see how the chef pairs the wine with with the meal. It's always interesting. And then just talking about the wine. You know, you're, you're almost like sharing it with the whole group of people that are at the dinner and just hearing their comments. It is, it's really fun. Right. I hope that that's like very much the experience that we try to create here um, to some extent at home. I hope that it, um, I hope that for those of you tuning in from home, it sort of feels like you're getting to um, share a big table. Um, yeah. That's definitely what we aim for. Um, Akasha Garnier said that she's intrigued by the melange of smooth, um, balanced, and medium body um, that's coming off of this Merlot. And um, Margot, uh, right for wine, wants to know if you're specifically coming to, um, I'm going to say this wrong, Semiamu Resort next month for the winemaker dinner. It's not on my schedule, so I'm not aware of it. Oh. <laughs> um, we'll have to look up and get back to you on who will be um, at that dinner. Yeah, so I mean, we share, um, Sarah Quieter, the executive, executive winemaker, shares some of those duties, and um, also Christine Ackerman that works out at Lazy Creek right. also will do some winemaker dinner. So we, we all get to share, share the fun. So if you've been to um, Ferrari Corona Winery uh, since 2008, is it? Ferrari Corona has owned Lazy Creek Lazy Vineyards, um, which is a small winery um, making Pinot Noir. It's still called Lazy Creek Vineyards, but it's Lazy Creek Vineyards by Ferrari Corona. Um, it's an older winery. I think it's 40 plus years old. Um, and it's in Anderson Valley in Mendocino County. Um, and that's where Christy Ackerman uh, works. And it's a... Um, just a really different vibe, um, winery style-wise, than Ferrari Corona, um, but the same um, wonderful mentality behind the winemaking. Um, again, all of the vineyards that uh, provide wine to Ferrari Corona and Lazy Creek Vineyards are certified California sustainable vineyards now, and um, Lazy Creek Vineyards Winery is also sustainably operated. Um, so it's a really cool, um, experience that's part of the Ferrari Crown family, and yet this distinct kind of offshoot. Um, but today we are not talking about Pinot Noir, we are talking about Bordeaux varieties, and so I am going to slide this below to the side and get this open. Um, I think we recommended in our email that you might want to open this a while before tasting or decant it, which we haven't done here. I know, I was yeah. noticing you didn't do that, but... Um, but we are tasting the 2012 um, Ferrari Corona Reserve Cabernet Sauvignon. You can see that it's from a different family of Ferrari Corona wines. The label is um, a different shape. The bottle is taller. I'm going to guess it has a longer cork inside of it. To, it does. Um, promote yes. aging. How long do you feel like this wine ages? This is like, you know, it could be like 10 to 20 years. Again, like it, it's going to depend on preference if you like your wine to be aged. Um, but you'll see once you taste this wine if you haven't already that it has a really nice, like, has some tannins there, really nice tannin structure. 
and fruit concentration to go right along with it. So it has this potential for aging for 10 to 20 years. Although, you can drink it right now too. <laughs> so it just comes down to preference if you like a younger, fruitier, more robust with a tannin type of wine, or if you like it to be a little softer and get more of the age, age character that you get with um, laying your wines down for a little longer. And how long is this aged before it's released? This wine has been only recently released, so it's had like about three years on the bottle. Two years. Two. This is the 2012, so 2012. I would think three, maybe? Well, it's like 20 months of 18 to 20 months of barrel aging before it's bottled. Got it. And so, then yeah. more time before release. Yeah. You are very welcome. You did all the work. All I did was open the port for you. That's the least that I could do. I am so excited to try this. Yeah, so while. like you said, if you haven't de you know, decanted it, just like give it some time because this wine um, definitely will just open up and you'll get a lot of um, just aromas coming out. Uh, it's complex, so it might start a little bit close, but it like, definitely opens up. Yeah, I can feel the aromas that are coming through are um, really deep, like dark berry fruit and stone fruit, like plum type stuff. Um, but it good. I mean, it smells good. But it does, but I can tell that it's like ready to just open. Even like the first swirl to now, it's yeah. different. Um, so it, it evolves as soon as it's open. So we were talking about packaging as a little bit different because this is part of our Vineyard Select series of wines that we do. And what it means, it's a reserve cab. It's, it's Vineyard Select because it's from, you know, select vineyards. <laughs> so it's actually coming from all the cabs sourced from one um, ranch. So it's our Lookout Mountain Ranch, which is down in southern Alexander Valley, and it's another um, mountain ranch, basically. It goes up pretty high elevation, starts at around 250 feet and goes up to 1,200, 1,300 feet in elevation. So that really makes some, you know, adds a lot of tannin structure to the wines that are, or the grapes that are grown on, on the property. Once you get to the top of this ranch, you have views of, you know, not only Alexander Valley, but you can see also Chalk Hill and Knights Valley. It's just, I mean, it's, it's gorgeous up there. It's really, um, the terrain up there is really steep and a lot of ravines and canyons. So it's quite a hike to get through these vineyards when, during harvest when we're going through and tasting the grapes. Um, so, but it's fun too because it's gorgeous out there. Um, Terry Sullivan, who uh, is a um, wine trail traveler um, and who cooked that lovely dinner that I mentioned earlier, um, he uh, commented he wrote a cab haiku, which was um, cassis blackberries, a food or rocking chair wine, enjoyed bold tannins. <laughs> I love that. I. Um, would say that this is sufficiently poetry inspiring. Um, I don't even feel ready to take a sip yet because I'm still enjoying the intriguing nose. Um, and then Mark Fusco noted that it is ready to drink right now. Um, and I think that's always the goal with release, that even if something can be aged, um, I think most be. of our wines are, you know, we do hold it in bottle and, you know, taste it before we release it. So we, most of the time, their wines are when we release them, you can drink them. So, I, which is great. This is nice. Um, but if you buy a case and have it around for a year or two years or five years, I think it'll still be nice to drink. It's quite, it's quite enjoyable. Terry and Kathy Sullivan are, are clearly um, our culinary friends. They're wine about and wine trail traveler. And, um, they are the ones who cooked Rhonda's recipe, and they just keep um, suggesting incredible pairings. Um, braised venison stew, um, which um, is, I think, maybe one of Rhonda's recipes, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
for the Merlot. I love that you guys are taking these recipes and trying them out. That sounds just awesome. Um, and then Amy Lieberfarb wants to know how much of the limited Alexander Valley Cab was made. Do you know how much was made this year? I, I don't remember. I know that sounds funny, but I'm working on this. I'm working on the 14 vintage, and I, yeah, I don't, I, I, mean, I don't really remember exactly how many cases. We'll get back to you. On it's, it's small. It's like very. Um, it's very limited where, I mean, it's not, I mean, you can have it, you'll find it maybe in a wine shop or maybe in a restaurant, but it's mostly sold out of the taste room here. So how many, um, how many different wines do you personally make? Um, do you know what Six or seven? <laughs> yeah, um, and you're working with, you don't really think about it like that. <laughs> and you're working with different vintages at different stages at one time. Yeah, right? yeah, like, um. Recently, just today, we we're starting our blending of our new wine we're making. It's called Una. It's a, a GSM, and we're making it for our wine club. And so that's it's a 15 wine. So it's one, you know, one of the first wines from the 15 that we're going to be working on blending and bottling. And then, but in the meantime, <laughs> coming up in um, next month, we'll be bottling the 14 Alabama Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. Awesome. Yeah. So, we're, like you said, we're working with two different vintages. At that's something. Time. Yeah, that's something yeah. that you don't necessarily think about. That you know, some wines get aged for eighteen months, twenty months, two years plus, um, which means that even if you make six or seven different wines, you're really working with twelve, fifteen, twenty wines at one time. Well, if you're talking, talking about stages, right? lots of wines, or I mean, I mean, and that's even another. That's another story, yeah, because what we do in the winery, we keep every vineyard block separate. So what that means, I mean, because it's just the way, you know, works better for all of our blending decisions. So we can evaluate each block separately. We can also take these blocks with our vineyard manager, Stephen Minichelli. So if he wants to make any adjustments in the vineyard, he can. He knows what what's going on out there. I mean, he does know what's going on out there, but he can also taste it in the wine. And so that's like, you know, we have, for me to vintage, around 250 different lots. When I was talking about tasting through wine every month, it's at least 250 in different lots, but then we also have the previous vintage that we're tasting this as well. That's lots so of lots. I don't know if that's what you're <laughs> meaning when you're talking about. Well, I was meaning both, honestly. We do lots of wine, yeah. About, um, we have purple teeth, like, every day. <laughs> I probably have purple teeth right now. <laughs> no, but it's more the young wines right out of the barrel. Um, They're much more settled down once we get in the bottle at this stage. This is beautiful. I'm really excited about having this wine. This feels like quite a treat. I feel like in contrast to the others, which are beautiful wines that I would not feel, um, would, that I feel would be totally appropriate to open on a Tuesday or a Thursday at 5, this is a wine that I don't usually get to open. At Thursday at five. Yeah, this is more of a special occasion. So if I'm having guests over and I'm cooking some filet mignon, I'm going to be having this wine. Yeah, if you don't finish, if you can resist <laughs> finishing this wine tonight, I think this is going to be um, perfect—a perfect Friday night holdover um, that you can share with friends or loved ones. Um, since you have opened it today, and we're getting some really nice feedback about this wine. Um, one of you, Wino, said that. Uh, she was getting all cocoa and cassis and blackberries. Um, so keep your thoughts coming on this and let us know what you're tasting. I think a few people got into this one before um, we were tasting it because they couldn't <laughs> resist. Um, and Sherry Hasman noted that it's a really great um, Cambozola pairing, which sounds yeah. excellent. Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah, um, blue cheese, I think. Uh, strong mm -hmm. cheese, like that's yeah, really nice. Oh, yeah. And Cambozola has a creamy flavor because yeah. it's like the Camembert Gorgonzola. Yeah, it's kind of a earthy, earthiness to it. Yeah, that looks. I'm hungry now. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it looks really good. So, um, ooh, we have a bunch of new comments. This is fun to continue reading through. Um, we have. Um, <laughs> Bill Iyer noted, and I know that Bill Iyer has worked in a retail environment with wine, 
um, for a long time. He noted that taller bottles do set them apart, but they can be a pain to stop on a shelf, <laughs> which is another reason that it's generous of Ferrari Colo not to sell this at most wine stores, <laughs> but to let you come to the winery for it. Um, you have all the more incentive to come here. Um, and to what else? Ourselves. Decanter or something? I don't have any decanter. Yeah, Jolene Patterson had the right idea. She said that she decanted the wine for 45 minutes to an hour and then it opened up beautifully. Um, great aromas we're hearing. Um, what, what would you say are the aromas that you get off of this wine and can you, I heard you, we made a video talking about this wine um, and I heard you talking about kind of um, different vineyard sites. Um, obviously this is a single vineyard yeah, one, but the different vineyard sites contributing different characteristics to the Merlot. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about this particular site that all of this wine comes from. Well, it's like the, um, the flavors are part of the flavors. I'm like, well, you know, the soil. There's so <laughs> much. I mean, you can tell me about the soil yeah, too. Um, We're interested I don't know a lot more to say about that other than, like I already said, they're pretty steep vineyards. Um, it's an ancient decomposed sandstone that um, is the soil, so it's kind of neat looking at it. But from, yeah, from the aromas, it's really dark. You get that, you know, some people were saying, because he's absolutely some currants, plums, and there's a little smokiness that you're getting from the, the barrel aspect of it, because it does have 42% new oak, mostly French oak, but we do put in a little bit of um, Eastern European oak, a little bit of just a smidge of American oak in this blend. So, but mostly, mostly all French oak. We like how that works with this wine. Um, I know some of the people who are tasting along tonight are um, professional songs who have done a lot of wine tasting. Uh -huh. um, I feel like when I first learned about blind tasting, I learned about French or American and Eastern European oak wasn't even really in the conversation. And I love that it's opened up to talk more about that. I've had yeah. fantastic Eastern European oh, wines, yeah. which are of course usually aged in Eastern European oak. Yeah. And um, I think also a lot of songs are trained to either taste for American or French, but it's neat to see um, that Ferrari Carano, Carano uses and has used um, three different kinds of oak and beyond that, you said I think um, 20 different Coopers. Yeah, we um, do. Um, it's one of our funnest tastes we do is when we we set up a barrel experiment every year, so we have all the same wine, same um, block of wine, so all say all cab, and we fill this, the same wine in all the barrels, all the different coopers that we have. So it's our barrel experiment usually is around forty different barrels. So that's you know it's like I said, mo mostly we source all French oak. Um, so it's mostly all French oak barrels. But we have different coopers. There's different um, forests in France where the barrels are coming from. There's thin staves, um, regular staves. There is a grain, fine grain, or extra fine type grain. So there's all, all sorts of different ways that you can order your barrels and toasting too. So medium, yeah. medium plus toast is what we are typically using. So we have all those different combinations, and that we go through and about quarterly taste all of those wines and just make sure that the oak is you know fitting nicely with the cab and that it's consistent what we expect from that barrel year to year it's a nice like checking kind of quality control that we can do and then um, and then we know what the barrel is giving us so we know what type of slice to put with the low or with the sienna yeah um, it's fascinating to talk about these decisions and what they impart in the wine with you. Um, we know that we started a little bit late, so we're going to wrap up um, late, but a little bit shy of an hour. Um, we're already a little bit late. I know that some of you have to go, um, and I hope that some of you don't have places to be and can just continue to enjoy this wine as we will be. Um, I will wrap up with um, just talking a little bit about food for this wine, so I just want to add Close by noting that I like this grape commented that they were surprised by um, the crispness of this wine. It does have a good acid backbone. And um, they said that they're going to pull out lamb chops to go with these oh, tonight. Nice. Which I, I think sounds yeah. awesome. Just that earthy flavor again. 
Um, but what uh, do you like with this wine? And then we'll say cheers to everyone and close out our show. If you have other questions, you can still tweet them at us and we will address them over Twitter um, or email and get back to you. What do I like with this wine? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely a steak, steak on the barbecue, especially now that it's summer. Um, and you can't have red wine, you know, during the summer. So um, pear is great with that. Burgers, my husband really likes to get the bison, buffalo type of burgers. So that goes great. Combine it with the blue cheese that you were talking about earlier. Wow. That is so tasty. And um, yes, and then like lamb. <laughs> so I love lamb and that sounds like a fabulous choice. Um, I think that really goes with the cigar box flavor that um, Mark Fusco was noting comes on this wine. And Jolene talked about um, this just being a fabulous representation of a 2012 cab um, with wild blackberries, currants, and mocha, which again, I think mm -hmm. integrates from that dark toasted oak, the oak, yes. So um, cheers, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, we will do it again sometime soon and uh, hope to have you back to chat more. Uh, there's a lot of wines at Ferrari Pirano, so it gives us plenty to talk about. Plenty uh, to talk about. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> and we're going to close our broadcast.